Okay, so now here's Philip Withnall to talk about glib. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a talk about uh, lots of work that other people have done that I'm going to claim credit for. Um, it's basically an overview of what's happened in the last year-ish, maybe a bit less than a year, um, from last November to today, from the 255.0 release, which was the start of the previous cycle, to now, where we are just about to release 2.57.2. Um, so, Maison has been a big thing that's happened in the Glib world. Um, it's been a big effort to port to Maison. Um, we are basically at feature parity with the Auto Tools build now, which is great because it means that we can start looking forward to dropping Auto Tools. Um, so, thank you very much to Xavier and Nabik for working on that um, and putting up with my constant requests for making sure that they actually remain feature. Um, sort of parity for platforms that most people don't really care about anymore um, because as a utility library, Glib is more cross-platform than most things. There'll be more information about where we're going to next with Maison later on in the talk. Um, GitLab is another big thing that's happened to us and is a big thing that's happened to many projects in GNOME. Um, I've found it's brought a lot more contributions to Glib, I think. Um, and again, I'll have a few stats on that later on. Um, but yes, thank, very big thanks to Carlos for doing that um, for, for everything, really. It's been great. It also means much better cross-platform support for us because we can now do continuous integration. I mean, this is fairly standard GitLab stuff, but it's made a huge amount of difference to us um, being able to test every comment on uh, one, two, three, four, or five. More than five platforms, um, which is pretty good, because it means that we've, we've already caught bugs that would have regressed us on platform supports, and we wouldn't have noticed them for a year. So this is great. We can also do code coverage testing um, within the continuous integration, which means that with every comic, we produce a report of what code's been tested and what code hasn't. Um, that was done by Christoph Reiter in 257.1. Um, and that's also good, because that means that whenever someone produces a, a merge request, I can go and look at the, the code coverage for it and say, um, you haven't tested this. Please go and test it, um, which is a great way to make loads of friends. Uh, we've focused a lot on getting a lot of documentation fixes in that were languishing in Bugzilla. So 75 of those have been committed since 255.0. Um, which, like, they're all fairly small improvements, but hopefully, in aggregate, that means the docs are a bit more useful to everyone, um, answering more common questions. But there's still work to be done here. So if, if there's anything that you, like, don't understand from the documentation or you think is missing, file an issue, and we can get it fixed. Or even better, put a merge request in, and we can get that in quickly. Um, we've had the oldest bug in the last year fixed was from the 100,000s. Um, that was dated from 2003, I think. So uh, George has fixed something that was almost an adult in bug terms, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it's a very boring function, but no. Nah. Um, and yeah, sort of going back to the, the documentation things, GitLab gets us some stats about how we're doing as a project. Um, and this is a blatant lie, because our current code review isn't two hours from someone submitting a merge request to it being uh, reviewed and merged. But um, it's, it's a pretty nice headline fig uh, figure. Um, I think, actually, we, s we sort of do code reviews in either about 10 minutes or either about three days. And it's a kind of a bimodal distribution. The average is probably about two hours. But, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's like the pace of development has picked up and the pace of contributions has picked up, and this is good. Um, here are some of those stats from the cycle analytics that GitLab provides. Um, so what have we got? This is in the last 30 days, 32 new issues, nearly 250 comments, um, and there's not enough data for quite a few of these sort of analytics to be done. Um, but hopefully, once we've got a few releases out on GitLab, we can start seeing, oh, it takes 
this much time to go from an issue being filed to it being in a release, and this much time for something to be filed to be triaged and that kind of thing, um, which would be kind of neat for doing project management. Another big thing that's happened, we've actually finally dropped Perl, um, which I've been looking forward to for a long time because I have an irrational hatred of Perl. Um, this is something that was started by Emanuele and carried on by Christoph. Um, and only really kicked off by porting to Maison because Maison brings in a Python dependency. And if you've got a Python dependency, why also have Perl in there? Um, so it's gone. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of slides looking at a few new APIs that we've got. Um, this is just a, a small selection of some of the things that have happened since November. Um, but hopefully they're the ones that are more interesting to people here. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to look at them very briefly, but they're all in, doc in the documentation if you want to go and look them up later. Um, so we've got, from the top, uh, a way of clearing integer handles like source IDs or bus name IDs um, so that you can tie that in with auto cleanup um, and you don't have to like call gsource to destroy yourself. Um, we've got a way of loading a file into a gbytes. We've got a way of building a date time from an ISO 8601 string. Um, a new way of building a g file that's like a combination of gbuild file name and g file new from path. Um, so you can just like construct something from a list of strings. Um, a replacement for g file get path, which you don't have to free anymore. These are all like tiny changes which should make your code a little bit more compact, basically. Um, improved support for getting time zones out of dates and times. Um, new ways of stealing things out of hash tables and pointer arrays so that you can actually reduce the number of hash table lookups you do when you're manipulating the hash table, which is neat. Um, some comparison functions with epsilons so that when you're dealing with floats, you don't have to worry about two things which have very, very similar numeric value, but slightly different binary representation, which you should probably compare equal. Um, and finally, for this slide, we've got ref counting APIs, which you can use in your own structs, which saves you reinventing reference counting yet again, um, which should make development of those little structs that you get everywhere and see just a little bit faster. Um, OSX content time fixes, there's a lot of work to be done here still, um, but we've moved a little way towards making it integrate better with how OSX represents file types and content types and MIME handling and things. Um, but yeah, there's, there's more stuff to be done there. Um, some of the GStreamer people have been working on statically linking in GIO modules, so that if you do a static build of GLib, you don't still have a load of um, DL opened libraries that bring in the GIO modules. Um, should make things a bit smaller for them. Um, type of fixes, this is an example of someone from a downstream project having a scratch, uh, a niche that they want to scratch and getting it fixed in glib so that everyone benefits. So we've now got better type checking for when you do object referencing. Thank you, Christian. Um, a new Windows network monitor implementation, because we've got a Linux one, but we never had a Windows one, so now you can monitor the network status on Windows. Um, Again, another thing from Christian where he was, he was scratching one of his itches was improving performance for slicing up a gbytes into smaller bits um, without copying all the data around several times. Um, a big load of work from Raval on case month names, um, nominative case and genitive case, where with some Slavic languages, I'm probably going to get this wrong because I don't speak any, um, so correct me. But uh, if you have a month's name and you want to put it together, together with a day, it changes case, and we couldn't support that before. Um, so that supports us in GLib, and it should automatically happen for you. Um, splice performance improvements when you're copying files on NFS, and a huge rewrite of the KQ file monitor for BSD so that it actually works. Um, so those are just some of the bigger changes, which I think is, is pretty neat. Um, it's great, because I didn't have to do any of that. People just contributed it, and, and it all got reviewed and put in. Um, oh, there's some more, sorry. Um, yeah, another bit from Christian on performance improvements on get type, um, improving the, the fast path there, so it's only a few instructions rather than quite a lot. Um, that's code that gets called every time you do an object cast in GObject. So it, it gets called quite a lot. 
Um, from the Maison and Windows side of things, we've dropped the Visual Studio projects that GLib had in Tree um, and now just use Maison. Um, basically, that was sort of um, an agreement between all of the people who build GLib on Windows and who help maintain it that they didn't care about maintaining the Visual Studio stuff in Tree anymore. They were just going to use Maison. Um, so they've, they've ported to Maison a bit earlier than everyone else. Um, I'll give some more details on the plan for Maison and GLib later on. Um, interface generation, so GBus, GBus code gen, uh, you can use to generate like a complete implementation of a GBus, GBus interface. Um, it now has a mode for just generating the uh, definition of the interface rather than the implementation as well. Um, bash completion is always good. POSIX spawn support, so we now support using POSIX spawn to uh, run a, as a process rather than fork and exec, which will give you performance improvements. Particularly, this means that the shell now will not refuse to start a program for you on a, a system with not very much memory, um, which is pretty neat. So that's something that Daniel Drake was working on for us at Endless. Um, per desktop overrides for G-setting schemas, where different desktops that aren't GNOME want different defaults for their settings. So yeah, they got that. Um, and Zafia has been doing work on Android, so we've sort of bumped up our, our support for that. Taking a look at who's contributed in the last, uh, well, since November. Um, charts, yeah, we've, we've got um, about 25% of our contributions have come from people in their spare time, unaffiliated to a company, as far as I can tell. This is all based on looking at the email addresses of the contributions and trying to work out which company they came from. So there's the big orange category is unaffiliated, and the big yellow category to the right of it is unknown, where I can't work it out, so it could be anything. Um, so there's, take this with a pinch of salt, but yeah. Um, about 90% of our contributions have come from a com combination of unaffiliated, unknown, endless, and red hat. Um, and based on that, uh, our current three maintainers are from endless, red hat, and unaffiliated, which I think is a fairly healthy state of affairs. Um, it's quite nice to have a variety of different inputs to the project coming from different places and, and um, different sort of employment drives. Um, so yeah, moving to some more stats, we've got a comet count here per year since 1998 because I found this program called Git Stats, which just like pulls through your entire repository and produces some really retro graphs. Um, I think the important thing here is that like we could ignore all the stuff before about 2010 because people use source control differently. Um, but over on the right-hand side, we've got about the same number of comets so far in 2018 as in the whole of 2017 and more than in 2016 already. So I think we're on a decent trajectory. This is the same kind of graph, but pulled out of GitLab, which is a bit harder to read um, when you're not like zoomed in. But again, I think it shows the comment density is a bit more dense in 2018. And then we've got the bug count, which I pulled this out of Bugzilla. Um, you can see the big drop on the right-hand side when we migrated to GitLab. Um, there's a, like a, a downwards trend around the end of 2017, where we started closing loads of old bugs because we were going to migrate to GitLab. Um, and then it leveled off a bit, I think. I can't get any stats for the number of open issues and the trajectory for that out of GitLab. Um, that would be a neat feature to have. Um, but I think we're roughly level at the moment at about 1,300 issues. I mean, GitLab doesn't provide that, but it does provide pretty other um, pretty graphs. So this one is the time it takes for each comet to be built by the, the CI system. Um, so the most recent 30 comets took around 13 minutes each to build, which I think shows that it's fairly consistent, apart from those three big spikes, which I can't explain, um, and not really impacting on our development speed. Like it, It's pretty fast to get a build done and tested. 
Um, and here we have the ones that have succeeded versus failed for the, the continuous integration. So green is success, gray is total, so the difference is the number of failed builds. Um, quite a few of those have come from where GitLab has been helpfully banning people um, for contributing too much, uh, which was a, like a rack attack ban. Um, but we think that's been fixed now, thanks to the sysadmins. Um, we'll see if that, that carries on. Um, but yeah, this like the number of failures there is not so high, and I don't think it's really affecting development time. So in the future, um, we've got a, a planning day all day tomorrow in the GTK Birds of a Feather room, uh, room two, I think. Um, so if you've got any suggestions, feedback, flames, whatever, come and talk to us there, um, and we can see if we can acquiesce to your requests. Um, but yeah, this, this slide and the next one, I've got a few things that I would like to focus on for the 2.60 release. Um, this is by no means final, and it's, it's very much open to working out how much time we have to spend on things, but it's, it's a starting point. Um, so we'd like to see some improvements to JIRA to add more uh, ancillary information that you can pass around, because this is a, a common request, and something that would make a lot of APIs a bit easier to extract error information from. Um, doing it in a backwards compatible way could actually be impossible, but we'll, we'll have to think about it. It's certainly worth some thought. Um, some of the GStreamer people have been looking at improving the IO streams API so that we can get zero copy performance out of it. Um, that's something that we're interested in. Um, generally tidying that all up and, and allowing uh, sort of scatter gather IO would be pretty neat. So that's, that's definitely worth a look at. Um, more, more platform support, better platform support. We've got continuous integration on various platforms at the moment, but a lot of them, the tests half fail, half succeed. We've sort of ignored the failing ones so far. There's some more platforms we'd like to bring in, so that's ongoing. Um, completing the port to Maison, obviously high up on the priority list. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, Dropping our Unicode tables is something that I'm kind of interested in. I think some people on embedded devices are interested as well, because they take up a fair amount of RAM. Um, and it turns out that looking at the loaded objects in a process, we actually have like two or three copies of the Unicode data, um, because various libraries link to libunistring, or the other one, or the glib one, and what's the point? So we'd like to tidy that up a bit, I think. Um, similarly, gslice might be time to drop it as a memory allocator. Um, it is no longer competitive with various allocators. It still holds its own pretty well, but it's not got the big advantage that it had five or 10 years ago. So it may be time to drop it. It's certainly worth discussion. Um, and libglib testing is something that I've been starting to work on in some spare time. It's a separate library for utilities for testing code, so like ways of saying, here's an object I've written, please test that the property implementation is all correct, or here's an IO stream I've written, please test that it holds all these invariants properly. Um, and so I'd like to start building up on that and provide ways of you to, for you to sort of just plug your code in and get a load of tests automatically done on it to make sure that it conforms to the standards of approaches for writing idiomatic glib code. So yeah, the Maison timeline, this has been published on the GTK Devel list, I think. But essentially, the next release we do, which will hopefully be in the next week, we're going to do with Ninja Dist, uh, rather than make Dist. Um, but we're going to recommend that distributions build it and package it using auto tools. Um, because there's still a few differences, some latent bugs and things um, in our ports to Maison that we don't want people to start dog fooding right yet. Um, although if you want to, if you want to take that on and try it out and file bugs, please do. Um, from the releases after that, 257.3 onwards, we will recommend building with Maison by default, but we will keep auto tools around for those who don't want to, um, and they should have equivalent functionality. And then from the start of the next development release, so 259.0 onwards, auto tools will be dropped. Gone, history, don't have to care about it ever again. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Obviously, a lot of this is dependent on things actually working at each step, so we could delay it in future if problems arise, but that's the plan we're working to at the moment. 
Um, as I said earlier, some platforms have already switched wholesale to Maison, so like the Windows people, they don't care about auto tools anymore. So yeah, um, how do you get involved? Please get involved. Um, we are in the GTK channel on irc.nome.org, or you can just come to GitLab, find an issue, file a merge request, fix a little documentation typo, whatever. Um, just get, get involved. We'll try and review your, your merge requests within two hours, unless they're big. Um, probably the way that most people get involved in Glib or make a contribution to it is to scratch your own itch in your program, write an API that you find useful when you're developing your code, test it for a bit, dog food it in your own code, and then eventually submit it to us because you think it'll be useful to other people. And then you're submitting something you've tested and you've verified already, um, and the API is fairly stable. So if you've got anything like that, like IDE task, you could submit it upstream. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, please do. Just a quick question. Uh, what were the six platforms that you mentioned? I omitted the list because I can't remember. Um, <laughs> Windows, Mac OS, FreeBSD is coming. There's an Android cross compilation. There's a Windows MinGW cross compilation. There's an MSYS2 machine. And there's Linux. Don't quote me on that. Um, Two questions. Should we stop using G-Slice? Maybe we'll answer that tomorrow. Or <laughs> um, the advice I've been giving to people over the last few years has been, yeah, don't bother unless you can demonstrate that it gives you a performance improvement. Um, it doesn't really matter at the moment. OK. Um, other question. I have this mock file, G file implementation that I've been trying to get into some library somewhere for forever. So would you like it in libglib testing? Yeah, please. Cool. <laughs> it's on GitLab. There's one up there. Good job, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, do you think it would be appropriate to start deprecating some of the most obscure G object features? Yeah, so something I thought about putting in this talk but didn't um, is the kind of very political thing about saying, oh, version 3.0. Hmm. Um, it's something I'm starting to think about, but I think it's a long way off yet. Um, I think. One of the things I would like to do in the BOF is have a think about where we want to go with GObject in future and how we can get there, whether we need to deprecate stuff, whether we need to rewrite stuff entirely, or whether we can maintain API, um, or whether there's actually nothing to do and it is indeed perfect. Um, I don't think it is, but yeah. Um, it's kind of on the horizon very, very far away. Uh, as a performance question, so a few years ago, I looked into the glib hash table and how it compares to something like Google's dense hash map. And at the time, at least, uh, the Google hash map one was like massively faster and it used a lot less memory. Um, like the, the things where you can't inline the function call because of the C++ C thing and because you need to have a pointer to your data. So you, now you have, whenever you, if you have 32-bit integers, you have 64-bit pointers to store that and, and all of the things that that entails. So would there be, has there been any thought about having a different kind of hash table maybe with a better performance because it's used quite a lot? What was that interjection? Yeah, so I actually looked into this. I was, um, I, I wanted to finish a blog post about it before the conference, but I couldn't finish it in time. 
but I have, um, I have some good statistics on that. And a lot of it is about um, performance of integer insertions versus strings. We are much faster on strings because we store the hash value, the computed hash value. We also don't need to have special keys for invalid uh, entries. Um, also, it depends a lot on if you're inserting random numbers uh, or if you're inserting uh, sequential integers uh, because of cache performance. And um, there are some bad cases. The Google, the Google hash table has problems with um, integers that are spaced by uh, power of two. So if you're inserting say pointers which are at two, 256 byte offsets, those can be really slow because they end up in the same bucket. Um, we don't have that problem. We have another problem though, which is a bit more complex. Um, if we insert a lot of in sequ uh, sequential integers which are densely packed, they end up in the first half of the hash table as we resize it and the second half or, or the later half of the hash table will be mostly unused. So it's really fast to insert, but when you age the hash table by doing many insertions and deletions, it gets really, really slow. So that, that's basically the summary. I have, I have statistics and some graphs and stuff, so maybe you wanna look at it. Cool, that sounds like a good blog post. Um, I think from my point of view, uh, I haven't looked at GHash table performance. I, if I did, I would be bearing in mind that it is an every man's hash table. Like it needs to hit the the middle of the bell curve of what people want out of a hash table in terms of performance for various different workloads and memory consumption. Um, so if people have specific needs for a hash table, they probably are better off using a custom one. If if they've got something, they really need to like be fast with integer performance or whatever, or have a, a really small memory overhead. Um, the GLib one is, is a pretty generic one and should remain that way. Any more questions? We are pretty much out of time anyway. Cool. Thanks.